and welcome to Tala Talks NICU, where we break down medical concepts and make them extremely easy for you to understand and retain forever. Today we are going over part two of the oscillators, and this one is going to emphasize more the whole clinical aspect of oscillators. If you haven't seen the first video, then go back and watch part one. This will not make as much sense if you just go straight into this video. In the meantime, also remember to like and to subscribe and let us know below what else you'd like us to talk about. In this video, we're going to go over two main topics and they both relate to oscillators. There'll be a whole separate video on jet ventilators, but we'll start off this video by talking about some clinical uses of the oscillator. So in which situations is the oscillator helpful? As part of that, we'll be discussing how it can potentially reduce lung injury and what are the different factors that actually cause lung injury. And in the second half of the video, we'll talk more practically about using the oscillator. So what settings we put babies on when we start them on the oscillator. There are a couple of settings that are pretty much standard, like the eye time and the flow, and these are really the respiratory therapist domain, so I'm not going to go over those. I am going to go over the frequency, or the hertz, as we talked about in the last lecture, the delta P, which is also called the amplitude, as well as the mean airway pressure, and what sort of settings we start babies on. Um, just as an aside, there are some institutions that use power instead of amplitude or delta P. You're basically trying to get the same sort of improvement in ventilation by dialing up the power or dialing up the delta P. But for now and today, I'm just going to be talking about the delta P and the amplitude. Right, so let's start by talking about the usage of the high frequency ventilator. When we are putting babies on high frequency ventilators, what we're ultimately trying to do is either to reduce the possibility of lung injury or to improve the general gas exchange by using an alternate method of gas exchange. Again, go back and watch the first video. Ultimately, when we put any baby on the ventilator, then really we want to use as gentle ventilation as possible. We know that using very aggressive ventilation will cause further lung injury. So it's very important for us that we try to reduce that lung injury to infants. So let's go on a slight trajectory and talk about what causes lung injury. Clinical studies in babies have shown that there are three main contributors to lung injury. The first one is barotrauma, which is when you use too high of a pressure on the infants, that in itself can be injurious. The second is volutrauma, which is where the lungs are stretched out to way more than they should be. So think about like a balloon, when you blow up a balloon and you really, really stretch it out to its absolute maximum, when you allow that balloon to deflate a bit, it kind of loses its shape. It becomes a lot boggier and less stretchable. And the third main mechanism is atelectotrauma. So remember, atelectasis means just collapse of the alveoli. So atelectotrauma happens in a situation where the PEEP, or the positive end expiratory pressure, again, go back to the ventilator videos, is not high enough. So what's happening is, is that during expiration, all those alveoli are just kind of collapsing. Then when the PIP is introduced, so during inspiration and you have much higher pressures, then those alveoli need to be popped open again. So you can imagine that if those alveoli are constantly being popping open and then collapsing and popping open at much higher pressures, they can get damaged very easily. On the conventional ventilator, the machine is constantly going between the PIP and the PEEP. So you can imagine, especially in a sick baby, it would be very easy to give too much pressure and cause barotrauma by just dialing up the PIP. Also, obviously, the tidal volume is determined by the difference in the PIP and the PEEP. And again, just like the PIP is too high, you can also imagine that it would be very easy to over distend the lungs by giving too high of a volume. Also, the PEEP might just not be high enough for all the alveoli. Logically, different alveoli would need different PEEPs to stay open most of the time. So a one alveoli might stay open on a PEEP of five, another set of alveoli may need a PEEP of seven. So obviously that could also contribute to some level of atelectotrauma. 
In the last video, we alluded to the fact the oscillators are open systems, which means that they give a constant distending pressure. And then there are tiny tidal volumes that are delivered at a very, very high rate around that constant opening pressure. If you remember from the conventional ventilator lectures, the mean airway pressure is the average between the PIP and the PEEP. Really, it's the weighted average because you generally spend more time in PEEP than in PIP. So generally, the mean airway pressure is kind of a little bit closer to the PEEP than the PIP. So oscillators, instead of using a PIP and a PEEP, have their own constant distending pressure, which is why you're dialing in the mean airway pressure. Now, because that mean airway pressure is by definition going to be lower than your PIP, or your peak inspiratory pressure, then by definition, you're much less likely to cause barrow trauma. Same thing with the atelactor trauma. The mean airway pressure is going to be higher than any peep that you would set on the conventional ventilator. So you're much less likely to cause atelactor trauma. And then because you're using the absolutely tiny tidal volumes, you're also less likely to, to cause volume trauma. This is all in theory. Clinically, and based on this fact that we are hopefully causing less lung injury when we put babies on the oscillator, generally we use the oscillator in two different settings. The first one is as a rescue therapy. So you are like maxed out on the conventional vent and you still don't have very good gas exchange. At that point, we need another form of another mechanism to be able to ventilate and oxygenate an infant. The second one is as kind of a prophylactic treatment. So you put tiny preemie babies straight on the oscillator or the jet after they're born in the hopes that by decreasing lung injury, they are less likely to get BPD or chronic lung disease. Theoretically, we would expect to see a lot of evidence that shows that high frequency ventilation does help in either of these settings. But really, there is not a lot of data out there showing that one mechanism is definitely better than the other. Multiple trials and multiple meta-analyses of these trials, a meta-analysis is when you put all the different studies together and try to make an even more convincing argument. Multiple meta-analyses and studies have been done trying to prove the effectiveness of one form of ventilation over the other. But really, there hasn't been any convincing evidence either way. That is because, and I think I've alluded to this many times in the past, that it is actually very difficult to prove things in the NICU. So to make any sort of convincing evidence, you have to add multiple studies together. So as soon as you start including different units over a period of time, you start incorporating so many other variables in, whether different units feed different babies differently, whether they use different amounts of steroids, surfactant, how, many, um, how much prenatal steroids have been given. So all of these things really come into play and may be affecting our ability to tease out exactly what is the most effective thing to be done. In most NICUs, we use high frequency ventilation when we've reached a point on conventional ventilation when we assume that the settings that we're on are causing lung damage or that even on pretty maximal settings, we're still not getting good at gas exchange. So for example, you have a term infant who is on a PIP of 35, a PEEP of seven or eight, a rate of 40, and despite all these settings, the CO2 is still in the 70s and the baby is satting in the 60s. At this point, we need something else. So this is called rescue therapy. Situations where this could happen in the NICU is, for example, with a meconium aspiration syndrome, with anything that causes PPHN, so whether it's sepsis or with a congenital diaphragmatic hernia or something else abnormal going on in the lungs. Um, also, really, it could be any situation where we have an oxygenation index above 15. As another aside here, another really helpful aspect of being able to use the oscillator as a rescue therapy is that with the oscillator, oxygenation and ventilation are completely separated. So remember on the conventional ventilator, if you go up on the PIP, then that will affect both oxygenation because it's obviously increasing the mean airway pressure. It's also affecting the ventilation because by going up on the PIP, you are probably creating a higher tidal volume because remember the tidal volume is determined by the difference between the PIP and the PEEP. 
Whereas on the oscillator, the oxygenation is determined by the mean airway pressure. So you just set the mean and that will tell you exactly how open your lungs are and how good that VQ matching is. And then ventilation is determined by the delta P or the amplitude. So you type those values in completely separately and they don't really affect each other at all. So for example, say you have a baby with a very bad pulmonary hyperplasia. So the baby had renal failure or doesn't have any kidneys or there was rupture of membrane at 19 weeks and there's hardly any fluid. So the lungs are very underdeveloped. We know that if we give these babies really high pressures, then they're at much higher risk of popping their lungs, so creating a pneumothorax. So what's helpful on the oscillator is that we can set the mean and then we can improve ventilation by increasing the delta P. Obviously, again, this is very difficult to prove in a study, but it is a very frequent use of the oscillator in the unit. The other main use, which is routine use in preemie babies, especially the micro preemie babies, is really dependent on the institutional preference. So if that's what your hospital does, then that's what you should be doing. Because we know when everybody in the unit does the same thing, the outcomes are better. Again, not very convincing evidence, but we all kind of think that that's probably because it's just very difficult to prove. Whatever you do in your unit, especially for micro preemies, but even for term babies, the most important thing is that you try to ventilate as gently as possible, whether that is on a conventional vent or whether it's on a high frequency vent. Right, let's go on to part two, and this is probably why you're here. And let's talk about the types of settings that we use when we put babies on the oscillator. Altogether, there are five different main numbers that need to be plugged into the oscillator. But like we already mentioned, two of them are pretty standard and the RT takes them over. The first one is the I time. And again, this is pretty standard and the RT will just normally plug this in. And it's normally 33% or an I over E ratio of one to two. If this is changed a lot, then you can end up with stacking of the breaths or not enough time for the little tidal volumes to be delivered. So it's always at 33%. The second is the bias flow. And again, this is something that the RT plugs in and is pretty standard. The bias flow will be dependent on the infant's weight. So generally, the higher the weight, the higher the bias flow, and it's measured in liters per minute. So normally in the unit, we're using somewhere between 10 and 20 liters per minute. Sometimes the RT will change the bias flow to help get the mean airway pressure that we're trying to deliver. So the remaining three settings are all numbers that you are responsible for coming up with. So the first one is the frequency or basically the rate that the machine is banging away at. And if you remember from the first lecture, the frequency is also dependent on the size of the infant. You know from the first video that what we're trying to do is to optimize gas exchange. And the way we do that is by tapping into the natural frequency of an object. So if it's a small body, a micro preemie, then we'll use a higher frequency. If it's a larger body or a full term infant, then we're going to use a lower frequency. Again, think of the analogy that we used in the first video, you, having a violin versus a double bass with a much lower frequency. For a premature infant, we'd start at a frequency of around 12 hertz, somewhere between 10 to 15 hertz. And for a full term baby, we'd start again at a lower frequency. So somewhere in the vicinity of eight to 10 hertz, maybe even going down to six hertz. Remember the unit hertz refers to cycles per second. So a rate of 600 or 600 breaths per minute is the equivalent of 10 hertz. Interestingly, we used to use slightly higher frequencies on preemie babies, kind of using routinely a hertz of 15 on micro preemies. More recently, it's been found that gas exchange is slightly improved on slightly lower frequencies. So now we'll generally be using hertz of 10 to 12, even on the micro preemies. Like we talked about in the last lecture, we don't generally change the frequency a lot because obviously the baby's weight is staying the same and so we are trying to optimize the gas exchange for that weight. There is one small caveat to this and I'll discuss it now. 
On a conventional ventilator, you all know that increasing the rate improves the ventilation. So for example, if you are on a rate of 20 and you increase the rate up to 40, then more carbon dioxide will be blown off, the infant's carbon dioxide will be lower, or another way of saying that is that ventilation will be improved. On the oscillator, the frequency or really the rate affects infants in exactly the opposite way. And this really confuses people a lot, but let me explain it now. The main reason for this is that at higher frequencies, there is more resistance in the dead space for delivering the same tidal volumes. If the frequency slows down, then the amount of pressure reaching the lungs will be higher. So you will get a higher tidal volume for the same delta P that was typed into the machine. Let's give an example of this. Let's say that you have a premature baby who is on a frequency of 12 hertz. Your mean is 12 and your delta P or amplitude is 25. You have a pretty good wiggle on the exam and you get a chest x-ray, but it's only about six to seven rib ex ribs expanded. You go ahead and get a gas and you see that the CO2 is in the 70s. Because you've already got a pretty good wiggle, then this isn't a baby that you'd necessarily want to go up on the delta P to say 30 or whatever. This could be a good situation to actually decrease the frequency. So we could go down from 12 to 10. By decreasing the frequency, even on the same delta P of 25, the lungs themselves are actually seeing a higher tidal volume because there's less resistance to the pressures that you're giving. So by going down on the frequency, we could improve the ventilation in this way because the tidal volume is going up. Also, because the tidal volume is slightly larger, you might also get to expand your lungs a bit. So hopefully the lungs will now be at ribs of kind of seven, eight rather than six, seven. So going down on the frequency can actually improve ventilation because the lungs are seeing a higher tidal volume and they can actually improve oxygenation as well because with slightly better expanded lungs, you have an improved mean airway pressure and better VQ matching. So changing the frequency, specifically going down on the frequency on an oscillator is really the only way where you can improve potentially oxygenation as well as ventilation. Again though, and I really want to emphasize this, generally when you're using the correct frequency for that size body, then you are optimizing gas exchange. So it's kind of one of the last things that we do. Normally we try to do everything else and keep the frequency the same. Right, so the fourth value or the second value that you have to determine is the mean airway pressure. Again, if you remember the conventional ventilator videos, the mean airway pressure is the weighted average. It's the average pressure that you're giving to the lungs between the PIP and the PEEP and the I time and the E time. In the oscillator, it is just one consistent number that's constantly keeping the lungs open to that pressure all the time. If we are converting an infant from the conventional ventilator to the oscillator, then generally we'll go up on the mean airway pressure by one or two points. So for example, if your mean on the conventional ventilator is 10, which by the way, the machine calculates. So you're normally typing in the PIP and the PEEP and the I time, and then the machine will kind of calculate it all out and there'll be a monitor that will give you what the mean airway pressure being delivered is. So say the mean airway pressure is 10 centimeters of water, then when we go onto the oscillator, then we'll go maybe 12, 14 on the oscillator. Remember again that the mean airway pressure is responsible for pushing open those alveoli and trying to optimize the VQ matching. So with better VQ matching, we have better oxygenation. So the mean airway pressure is the main determinant of oxygenation. Generally, with a higher mean airway pressure, you're going to improve your oxygenation. So whenever you put a baby on the oscillator, you should get an x-ray a couple of hours later just to see how expanded the lungs are. Really, ideally, you want the lungs somewhere between seven and nine ribs expanded.
If they are expanded to 10, 11 ribs and the diaphragms are flattened, then at that point you're really over distending the lungs. So that could cause volume trauma, but also at that point you also start worrying that you are decreasing venous return to the heart. So your baby is a lot more likely to become hypotensive if your lungs are super overexpanded because you're decreasing the amount of blood that can come back to the heart. Very often when the lungs are expanded to 10, 11 ribs and the diaphragms are flat, then the heart will look really skinny on the x-ray and our blood pressure will start going down. But to summarize, generally, the higher the mean airway pressure, the improve the oxygenation up to a point. And when you switch from the conventional to the oscillator, you're generally going up by about two to four centimeters of water as compared to the mean on the conventional ventilator. Right, the fifth and the last parameter that you'd be setting on the oscillator is the delta P or the amplitude. So you are typing in a number, which is basically the difference between the upper and the lower pressures that you're giving, the delta P, the difference in the P, and that is what is going to give the tidal volume, those tiny tidal volumes that are vibrating and making the chest wiggle. Just like the tidal volume on the conventional ventilators, the delta P is the biggest determinant of ventilation. So by increasing the delta P, generally you're going to improve the ventilation or get rid of more carbon dioxide. This is kind of an arbitrary number when we type it in, because in reality, the numbers that we type into the machine, the pressures that we type into the machine are actually much higher pressures than what are being delivered to the lungs because of the amount of resistance in the trachea and the bronchi and everything else. Also, like we said earlier, the frequency determines exactly how much of that pressure gets through. When the frequency is lower, generally the pressures that reach the lungs are slightly higher. Also, we can't really calculate exactly what that tidal volume is or the pressures that are being delivered to the lungs. So instead, we rely on a good physical exam or more specifically, what we want to see is a good wiggle of the chest or we want to see the chest vibrating nicely. As a rough number, you can take the mean airway pressure, multiply it by two, and then use kind of plus or minus two from there. So for example, say I was on a mean airway pressure of 10, then I might start on an initial delta P of 18. Then I look at the baby. If the baby still looks like he's not really, his chest really isn't wiggling that much, then I might go up on the delta P a bit. So say I go up to 20, if suddenly, on a delta P of 20, the baby looks like he's about to bounce off the bed because his whole body and abdomen is jiggling, then I'll lower the delta P a bit and maybe we'll end up on a delta P of 19. Ultimately, soon after you place the baby on the oscillator, you need to get a gas, kind of very similar to the x-ray with the oxygenation, the mean and everything. You need a gas really to figure out if the ventilation is fine. So sometimes we're very wrong. The baby looks like he's jiggling really well, but we'll get a gas and the CO2 is still in the 80s. In these situations, we'll get a gas, we'll maybe play around with the machine a bit more, maybe go down on the frequency or just go up on the mean or anything else that we can try to do to optimize gas exchange. And then we'll repeat a gas. Sometimes this all works out perfectly, but sometimes the gas is still atrocious. And at that point, you just have to determine that this form of ventilation is not the ideal gas exchange for this baby. And you have to go to another form, whether it's back to the conventional or whether it's the jet. So let's summarize. On the oscillator, to improve oxygenation, you can go up on the FiO2, obviously, the amount of inhaled oxygen that you're giving the baby, and you can go up on the mean airway pressure. Obviously, again, to a maximum, you don't want to over distend the lungs. You can also maybe go down on the frequency because sometimes frequency helps open up the lungs a little bit more to improve ventilation or to get rid of more carbon dioxide, then you can go up on the delta P or the amplitude, or again, rarely, you could go down on the frequency. Obviously then we can wean by doing the opposite. So going down or up on all of these parameters. Interestingly, you can actually extubate directly from the oscillator. And the reason for that is if you think about it, if your mean is low enough, say your mean is seven, 
and you're giving a very small delta p so say your delta p is 14 or 15 you're kind of giving cpap at that point so we've extubated many babies directly from the oscillator onto cpap that was a lot of information today i really hope that you did learn something Ultimately, it's a very complicated machine and really the best thing that you can do is spend as much time as possible at bedside learning the nuances from it from other people and especially the respiratory therapists. So in the meantime, remember to like and subscribe and let us know what you'd like me to talk about next. Thank you.